about a couple of things. Today we're going to be talking about the powers, plurally, of righteousness and wickedness. These are two powers. They're not Baptist or Methodist or Pentecostal or Catholic or Jewish or Islamic. But these are two basic world powers. These powers outdate any other uh, power that you may know a person. Righteousness and wickedness. It was accounted to Abraham because he believed God as righteousness. And we're going to try to discover those out of a message that out of a uh, event that took place on this past Sabbath. As I was teaching, I was raising the question about why is it that people choose wickedness over righteousness 99 to 1? And the other is, why is it that God doesn't just force everybody to obey him? What's all this tribulation going to kill 7 billion people and have killed more and are killing people now? Why not, rather than choosing to kill them, why not choose to make them obey him? And then everybody, every day on planet Earth will be, you know, the month of May. And every day will be Sunday and every, you know, there'll be no more sickness, no this, that, or the other. I'm going to provide those answers. I do have those answers. I raised those questions on this past Sabbath. I do have those answers. I'm going to provide them as well. But before I get there, I want to date today, of course, for posterity today, on the global and U.S. coronavirus deaths and cases. Right now, there are over 2.5 million people that have been diagnosed with coronavirus. You can multiply that by a factor of 10. This is just what's been reported. Uh, but that which is absolute, as you can multiply, should be about 25 million people if my math is correct. Now, the number of deaths that have taken place over the, the, since the coronavirus uh, episode, uh, the number of deaths globally is 178,491, something like that. Again, multiply that as a true, the true number it should be a multiple, multiplication by a factor of 10 of the 178,000. And then, of course, right here in the U.S. individually, there have been 825,306 cases so far diagnosed. Again, multiply that by a factor of 10. And the number of deaths, and by the way, yesterday, the 21st of, of uh, April, saw the largest number of deaths in the U.S. of A., uh, since this event has taken place, 2,600 people died. 20, 2,600 people rather died yesterday, and New York was not the largest number. It was was no longer the the largest number. People are dying in other places, and we're going to get to that in this segment, and also in the uh, the Manning report segment. To also, that we'll be we'll be dealing with. Now, having made uh, some statements about my being all prayed up as I was over this past weekend. Uh, the Lord said to me that I was constantly praying for the members of the church, constantly praying for the children, for the elders, and praying the removal of sickness and healing and all that, and, and really kind of wearing out the prayer cloth, the prayer mat on that whole issue. And the Lord said to me that I was all prayed up, I was all in. That is to say, that prayer has been hate, prayed, has been prayed, has been received, and has been answered affirmatively, positively, that prayer. And so, and then the other item, of course, is that we have to understand as the members of the elect that God has designated certain things for us nonetheless. And so I, I, our destiny has already been, has been destined. And I'm going to talk a little bit about John Calvin, the, you know, French reformist uh, in his predestination uh, uh, philosophical and theological idea. I'm going to get to that a little bit later on today. Uh, but also we were able to discover over the past few days, as I recap now, that my mission now, since I am praying, I need to, I need to widen my, enlarge my tent of prayer to cover the 50,000 righteous men. Now we're going to be talking about the choice of righteousness and wickedness in a second or two. To, and, and why it is that God doesn't just force everybody to worship him. Why kill everybody, force them to worship him? We get it, we're going to get to that. But the Lord also said this weekend, I just learned this weekend, by the way. You know, since 1991, some 29 years ago, 
that I now must, if when I do pray, my prayers must cover the 50,000 righteous men that have been assigned to my, my shepherdship, to my charge that there are 50,000 righteous men, and that's just the men. There are also uh, women and children, so you can figure that's probably four to five times as many women and children associated with that 50,000 righteous men as, as it was with Jesus in the days when he fed the, 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 the two loaves and the five fishes. There were 20,000, 5,000 men out there in the desert that day, the Bible said, uh, besides the women and children. So you'll figure the same thing here that the Lord has said to me, so my prayer, my ministry prayer now needs to cover, I need to acknowledge the 50,000 righteous men that God has put me in charge of. And we'll talk more about that in the days to come. And then of course we're able to discover, not just discover that about my, where my prayer life goes now, but you know, I was able to determine, I had not said I hadn't prayed in 20 years, I don't know if it was that many years, but given a good 12 years, I had not said any kind of prayer. When I met Jesus in the Brooklyn House of Detention, I, 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 had not, I don't think I said a prayer to, you know, to, um, by the way, you can always, you can still say, Lord, help me, please help me, Jesus. That's always cool. You know, you can always say, Lord, help me, please help me, Jesus. And I do, I, I pray that prayer all, all the time. He said, well, isn't that a repetitious prayer? It very well may be, but I'm going to keep on saying it because he hasn't rejected that. But no, I, I, you know, I probably had not prayed when I met Jesus in 1976 in the Brooklyn House of Detention. I probably hadn't said any kind of, I mean, any kind of prayer, even a prayer over my food. Well, maybe I prayed and said, pray to, say, pray to a prayer at a Thanksgiving dinner to, you know. But beyond that, I was pretty bored of prayers for 12, 12 years, 12 or longer. And at that time, that my first prayer also was my first fast and that three-day anointing. And all uh, the only conversation between me and Jesus uh, on that three-day anointing was, Lord, would you look upon me as you did your servant David? I want to be like David, the king of Israel, you know, the Goliath slayer, mainly because I didn't know a lot of other characters in the Bible. I mean, I probably knew about Moses, but I wasn't all that up on him. I knew David because he slew Goliath. I liked that. I knew about Paul, but that was not, you know, but my real heart was to be like David. So now, so this past Sabbath worship, when I was teaching about sinners in the hands of an angry God, a God is angry and bitter in that Sabbath worship, I raised the question, why do people choose evil? You can say what you want. You can put your head in the sand like an ostrich. But 99.999% of the people that you know, and especially the ones inside of religious organizations, choose evil. Ones outside of the religious organization are just evil as it goes, as the, as the crow flies. My question is this. I mean, you look around. That That's evil everywhere. And sometimes people try to use goodness because they got an evil purpose. They got, you know, they got a hidden motive. And that's why they're using evil. And then, and I was because, you know, why can't we just have planet Earth as this most beautiful place? No wars, no sickness, no hatred, no lying, no cheating. I was going through the scriptures, <laughs> through the verses last night in, um, uh, in Exodus, right? Chapter 20. I didn't tell the engineer about this, but I was going through the verses. And, and, and I was just having some fun. I, this, is not a, this is not a real trip for me. But I was, I was going through the verses about, you know, the commandments. Why, and when you're looking at why people, you know, why people, um, you know, why people, um, why people don't like, why people don't choose righteousness. So watch this. I was doing it, it. So here's the Ten Commandments. And I was, just, I was just having some fun. The Lord let me do this. He might not let you do it, so don't you try it. But I was, I was having some fun pretending to be an extraordinary evil person. So I don't like none of these commandments. But really, I was mimicking the whole of humanity. I don't like the command. Watch this. Here are the top 10 commandments, right? Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. And, the God, and God spake unto all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of, the, of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Really? 
Ничего. Thou uh, shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. So I don't like that one either. Uh, six days shall not uh, remember the Sabbath day and keep that holy. I don't like that one either. Uh, anyway, I think this is probably losing the context. I, last night I was doing this last night. It's a theological exercise, so it probably doesn't have the kind of context. But when you get down to thou shalt not lie, why not? <laughs> thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Why not? Thou shalt not kill. Why not? Thou shalt not steal. Who's, why? Why not? I was having some theological fun. Scratch that. All right, let's exercise it out of the lesson totally today of, of my musing on the, on the verses. So he, why, doesn't, why doesn't Almighty God, his name is Jesus, why doesn't he just make everybody? What's this business of free will? Now, I'm going to come to that in a fuller explanation in, in a moment. I said there is no such thing as free will, and there isn't. But why is it that that God, Jesus doesn't force everybody to, to bow down to him. Why? Why? You know, and, and if, if his program is a better program than the program of the devil, and then that, is that another question? I mean, is the devil's program a better program than God's program? And so that's why people choose the best. We'll, we'll try to get to that also in terms of, you know, trying to come to understand. But why does it, and Paul was speaking philosophically when he said every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. I, 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 I you know, I have never seen that happen. I've never seen that happen. But Paul is he, he, he's being philosophical there. So why don't people just bow down and worship the Lord? What's all this killing everybody? So I raised a question, and, and Deborah countered with a text to me about, and, and so did uh, Precious LaFleur. They both countered, because it's a, it's a question I think that catches people's attention. Why is it, or is there something that's missing in the 66 canonized books of the Bible? By that I mean, should not those books have given us a full definition and explanation and one of the big humongous explanations to wonder why did Eve do what she did? Why'd she do that? We know what she did, but we don't know what her motives were. Why? You know, and why is there something missing in scripture that goes right down from Eve right down to present day while well, people do the things that they do? And, and what they do is evil. We can probably understand if someone does something that, that is righteous, we can probably understand clearly why, what their motives were. But evil, well, we can attribute most of it to, you know, to money or to fame or to power. But, but, is there something missing in the canonized book that, we, that, that should be here? In other words, we don't have a full text on the information giving us a clear understanding why people choose evil. I mean, if you read Psalms 37, yeah, it's got to blow your mind because it goes from the wicked to the righteous. The way it talks about what the wicked does and what the righteous does and what God does to the wicked and what God does to the righteous. And I tell you, anybody reading Psalm 37 ought to come away saying, well, I'm standing the heck away from being wicked because God socks it to the wicked and he blesses the righteous. It's a great psalm. I don't have time to read it today. My time is moving along real fast today. I, but read it. Psalm, and read it in the context of the wicked and the righteous and what happens to each one of them and who actually is wicked. Maybe you're one of the wicked ones. And then read it in the context of the fight, fact that I'm always preaching righteousness. All right. So is there something missing in the Bible that we should know that's been left out that would explain all of this? And then the other thing I think is very quite, this has always been a question of mine. Why is it there's such a protracted amount of time between 
the edge of the paradise, the Garden of Eden, where God put Adam and Eve out, to Revelation chapter 20, 21, and 22. You got all that time. You got Moses up in there. You got Abraham up in there. You got, I don't know, you got Elijah. You got Esther. You know, you got the Bible. You got Jehoshaphat. You got Samuel. You got Saul. You got David. You got Ezra. You got Nehemiah. All up in there. You got all of them in there. And, and then you got Jesus. Then you got the, the Peter and Paul. You got, the, uh, you got all of that. And you got now. And still, did this matter, what happened in the garden, has not been resolved. And you can try to get philosophical, which I've tried to do and failed. Because from, from the Garden of Eden, to God putting Adam and Eve out to present, you know, and then the prophecy that Jesus gives to cover that is in Matthew 24 regarding the tribulation, which we're in right now. You know, I'm ready to go ahead now and say that the coronavirus is a pestilence. Generally, pestilences are life there are, there, there, there are, you know, rodents of mosquitoes or, you know, some sort of insect. But what those, or bats for that matter, and, and what those things do, they, they pestilence, they, they, first of all, they give you, drive you crazy by their, you know, like Moses with that, the locust came in and ate up all the crops. I'll, 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 I'll come back to that in terms of the pestilence and the coronavirus business that we're presently in. But why is it there's been such a, God has not resolved. This matter of sin, righteousness, and wickedness has not been resolved. Not fully. I mean, there's been an application called Moses and the law, Mount Sinai. By the way, I don't know how many of you, you know, know of, uh, you know, the Mount Sinai Hospital is a pretty popular name of a hospital globally. But also the second most popular hospital globally name is St. Luke's. You, you know, and you may have not have thought about this. I thought I'd tell you, maybe now you'll think about it. Maybe you didn't think about it. But, you know, Luke, Theophilus, the gospel writer of Luke and, 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 the, and the gospel, you know, Luke was not a disciple. But he was a doctor, right? He wrote both the book of Luke's and the book of Acts, book of Luke, Gospel of Luke, rather, and the book of Acts. He was a doctor, actually a medical doctor, as medical doctors go in the first century. Luke was one of them. And his, and his, and his writing of the gospel is heavily laced with a lot of Mark influence. Well, there's no doubt about that. John Mark, who was also not a disciple as well. But a lot of hospitals are named St. Luke's, going all the way back to that biblical time. But because people are trying to grab from that name a healing power, and, and rightly so. St. Luke's Hospital. They got one right across the street over here, about two, four, four, five blocks from here as the crow flies going west. It's St. Luke's Hospital over there on Amsterdam Avenue. They got them all over the place. Then they got Mount Sinai. Now, Mount Sinai is the biggest one. Because they're also the people of the medical profession and religious profession have discovered that Mount Sinai is the most healing place on planet, that, that more power came down from Mount Sinai and Moses and the law. And so name the hospital Mount Sinai, even though the law was given, power was given on Mount Sinai. And yet where, where you turned is a Mount Sinai hospital. Everywhere, Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai East, Mount Sinai West, Mount Sinai Brooklyn, Mount Sinai Queens, in New York. But they're all over there. Mount Sinai, Tennessee, Kentucky. I th what was I talking about? That wasn't a part of the lesson. Oh, uh, just an aside. I do that from time to time. I figure you might be interested in kind of trivial stuff like that, right? My question is, is that why is it that Jesus is using all this time to resolve this matter. Now, it says in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, 21, and 23, that all this gets resolved. And we all go off into the sunset with the new heaven and the new earth. And by the way, I'm not trivializing this, nor minimizing the efficacy, the efficacy of the importance of the God forbid. God forbid that I try to make light of this. Or God slapped the rest of the little hair I got on my head off my hair. If I would try to, I'm not, I'm, 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 I'm asking questions because I don't, think that the Lord is angry with me for asking these questions. I think he's put it in my spirit to try to talk to you about 
why people choose wickedness over righteousness. And, 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 and in that question context, if you began to fully examine, you would discover it's been a long time and this matter still ain't resolved. It didn't get resolved with Jesus. I mean, the blood ran down, salvation made available. I'm saved, praise God, full of the Holy Ghost and talking in tongues. But it ain't resolved. And I mean, it ain't over. The devil is still hounding me and you. I mean, he even told Peter, the devil gonna go after you. By the way, Y'all need to know that Jesus has prayed for me. Ain't that wonderful? Ha! No, he has. And he told me to pray for you, the way he did with Peter. Mr. Angel, you find that verse? He told me, to, he, Jesus, I was with Jesus for three days in that, uh, in that jail cell, right? And, uh, you know, I asked, I asked prayer. I, I, I had just one prayer. I wanted to be like David. Right? That was it. He granted it. But the anointing and the, the meeting stayed three days. Jesus stayed with me to the end of the fast. I, and after the fast was over, he left. He left the jail cell. But no, he told Peter, Simon, behold, Satan have desired to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. Jesus has prayed for me, homie. I can tell you this right now. 44 years ago, Jesus prayed for me. That's right. That's how come I am who I am. Now, I don't mean to be arrogant or anything. Sometimes I'll get a little bit excited about everything, and I should, rightly so. But Jesus prayed for me. And, I, and my hand, he told me to pray for you. Now I'm praying for the 50,000 righteous men as well. But why is it that this thing has not been resolved? I mean, you know, it's been... We still got some time to go. And one of the resolutions to the whole problem of sin and what happened in the Garden of Eden and the failure of those of the law and the failure of, the, of those of the blood and the Bible and the Holy Ghost is the tribulation. That's one of the ways this matter gets resolved. It ain't the, it's the most ultimate way so far. But, you know, that's, but it's not resolved. And the time is marching on. We're looking at a potential of 7,000 years. And this thing ain't been resolved as of yet. But the tribulation is one of the answer. You know, but before that, you know, I mean, I mean, even with Noah and the flood, God says he wiped out everybody except the eight souls. And that didn't solve everything. So, and then there's the fire and brimstone over the Sod Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, with the Sodomites. That didn't solve anything. You got more sodomized now than you got maybe had then. Um, so I think the partial answer is this, is that why is it that people choose wickedness rather than righteousness? Now, it very well may be that they don't choose. And I'm going to try to explain this. I hope I don't you know, get into a lot of trouble here, but there was a fellow named John Calvin. He was born in France, right? And I think it was in, what was the year? 1509, in the 16th century, the early days of the 16th century, at the conclusion of the, uh, the time of the Reformation of Martin Luther. And John Calvin, who was a philosopher and a theologian, concluded after studying the scriptures, and by the way, he wasn't so much a disciple of Martin Luther, as he was of Augustine, the great first century prophet, one of the great, one of the great teachers and apostles of the first century and writers of the city of God, uh, Augustine. Augustine was a, was a heretic. He was a whoremonger. He was a liar, a thief, and a scoundrel. And God saved him, Augustine. And Augustine's theory was that even how he was the most wicked person. And there were priests and other people, Apostle Paul and many of the churches that Paul, the Apostle Paul had established, and God didn't choose them. They, God chose a wicked man like Augustine. And that impressed Calvin some 1500, John Calvin some 1,500 years later. So he was known primarily as a student, at least that's what they say. I don't know how true it is, of, of Augustine. But Calvin had this, John Calvin, 
has developed what is now now known in many of the church circles, and people don't talk about this very much anymore. And I'm not sure I should spend a lot of time talking about it either. Except I'm trying to get to a I'm trying to get to an answer. Why is it that the wicked people choose wickedness? Why is it taking God so long to revolve, resolve this? And when you begin to investigate, I want to look at some people who've done a similar investigation into such questions as whether or not the Bible is giving us all the answers. And the, yes, it has. Let me see that now. Yeah, there's every, everything you want to know, everything you need to know is in here. Yes, I'm going to show it to you. But I'm simply talking about John Calvin and, and Augustine because I want to look at some people who I respect who have raised similar kinds of questions over the period of years. And Calvin, John Calvin's raising of the question was so profound in the Lutheran church in the Reformation days that they actually called it a doctrine of Calvinism. And that is to say, a doctrine of predestination. That, that, that is, Calvin's, John Calvin's doctrine of predestination was of such that God chooses who will enter into heaven whether they be wicked or righteous, he makes the choice. And, and it's called, he predestines people. For instance, when Jesus said in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 28, some are standing here, meaning that some that are standing here ain't going to be going into the 1,000 year reign of peace. Some standing here ain't going to see me return, but there's some standing here that will. And that those that were standing didn't make the choice. Jesus made the choice. So predestination is the Calvinist ideology or theology that, that Jesus makes to the, he said some, he didn't say everybody here. He said some, and probably, probably could have added by saying just a few standing here. But what about the others that were standing there? No, they're not one of the ones that's going to make it. So one could call that a Calvinistic idea that it is, you know, it is laced in predestination and that God makes the choice. Mr. Engineer, find 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. I want to show you something as well as we discuss. So, you know, we're our Calvinists, which I am not. Uh, then you might retort by asking, well, if you're not a Calvinist, why, would, why did you give that explanation? Do you just believe what you just said? that Jesus chose some and others he did not choose? I'm, I'm, I'm going to answer that question in just a second. But I, I do want to, I, I asked the engineer to find 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, because you know in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, verse 20 and 21, we get the, is it 21, 22? We get the statement about the elect, right? Let me see what's that. Hold on a second. I'll be right there. Hold on. I'm coming. Sam and Dave. Um, verse 22. Uh, except those days should be shortened, then should no flesh be saved except for the elect's sake, right? So, Mr. Engineer, take me back to Peter, right, who was standing there when that was said. And Peter writes in his first epistle, he writes, um, and he starts that epistle with this new destination called the elect. Now listen to this very carefully, because Calvin weighed heavily on this. I mean, I've looked at this, and I, you know, I'm not, but here's what Peter says. Peter says, after standing there hearing Jesus say that some will be, some are chosen and the rest of y'all are not chosen. He says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit. Now the rest of that gets into some other theological idea, ideas, but effectively what the first part of that paragraph says, with the foreknowledge, meaning that even before people knew who they were or were born, God knew who the elect would be, even before the people were born. Like, for instance, uh, uh, was it Jeremiah? That I've chosen you to be a prophet even before you came out of your mother's womb. You were, uh, you were ordained a prophet. So the, uh, uh, Peter writes about the elect that God knew who they were going to be even before they were. According to his knowledge. 
And then Paul, Peter goes on to write through the process of sanctification unto obedience of the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. And then he gives a little salutation there. So was Peter, was, I mean, actually this is one of the strongest verses that probably John Calvin probably dealt with. But you can say the same thing out of Jeremiah, Mr. Engineer. God told to Jeremiah, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, the foreknowledge. The foreknowledge of Jeremiah. And by the way, Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah went to God after he had a real tough time. Nobody liked him. They didn't like the fact that he didn't preach, you know, happy, happy messages. He didn't preach, have your best day. He didn't preach, you know, you're going to prosper. He didn't preach any of those things. And nobody liked Jeremiah. In fact, the king, they had him arrested, put him in prison, let him out. Then they tried to camouflage his death by throwing him down into a deep well, and a friend came and pulled him up out of the, out of the miry clay. Then they put him in a log and tried to roll him down a hill. Uh, nobody liked Jeremiah. He just was not liked. No, and nobody followed him either, by the way. He didn't have any members. They didn't like him. So Jeremiah gets to the point where he's been doing this for about 40 years, and he tells Jesus, he said, listen, I ain't doing this no more. You know, you got me out there preaching all these messages about people going to hell, all this wickedness, and God's going to destroy you, and, and you got this old phony religion going inside the temple, and you're doing all your praise dances and talking in tongues, and, and all y'all trying to get the best seats in the synagogue, and all that kind of nonsense going on, and you're just a bunch of hypocrites. Jesus don't even go in that temple with y'all. He ain't a, and, 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 and people didn't like him. They didn't like him. I'm saying that because I feel like Jeremiah's brother. But having said that, whether you believe it about me or not, you know, because many of y'all don't like me because I don't tell you like Joe Osteen. Yeah. Hope over here. Fear over here. Have your best day of hope. Hope. You know. So Jeremiah walked up to God one day like Elijah did. Jeremiah told God, I ain't preaching no more. I, I've had it. Ain't nobody paying no attention to me. I've been telling people about righteousness. I've been telling people about you. And they still worship the devil. Lie, cheat. Them priests in there, uh, them rabbis inside that temple, ain't there one of them that been called by you. You don't even know their names, and you know everything, and you don't know their names. And yet they're in there, people in there worshiping, they're all packed up, jammed up in there, all in there, in the, and, and here I'm on the outside. He said, I ain't preaching no more. Told the Lord, he said, I ain't doing this no more. You can get yourself somebody else. You know what the end of that, at least some of you may not know a whole lot, a whole lot about the Bible, but you know what God said to him. You know, you're going to do it. And Jeremiah said, the, the, you know, the word of God was shut up in him like fire in his bones. So here, the question is this, is that why is it taking so long for God to resolve this? And we know it can't get resolved. It can't get resolved until the tribulation has run. That's a, that's a part of the process. But I got an answer. So if you, you know, if I, all that was my introduction, I've got some answers about beyond what, what John Calvin has said and whether, he, whether I'm a Calvinist or not and whether there's predestination or not. Let me try to explain this. I'm not a Calvinist. The problem is, however, as Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, the problem is, it's hard for something to happen without God knowing about it. You say, well, that's Calvinist ideology. Listen, I, 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 I'm not a Calvinist, all right? And I'll explain to you why, as we, as we did, not today, but as the lesson goes on. But my point is this. It is hard for something to happen that God does not have full knowledge of. In other words, let's say you're driving down the street, you have an accident. Oh, God said, oh, God, get, get the emergency people. Oh, I didn't know it was going to be an accident. I was just getting ready to have lunch, and there's an accident. No, he knows about it. He knew about it. He has full knowledge. My argument with John Calvin and with Augustine was this. 
is God knows about it. He knows it's going to happen. But the, the idea that it's inescapable is, is a question. That is to say that God knows that you're going to bust hell wide open, but you can repent. You can avoid the accident. And that tears, in my, in my estimation, that tears down the control of predestination because you can repent. Or you can go another route. You can go another way. And, and that within itself. For instance, when Herod tried to kill Jesus, he went, his father took him down to Egypt. I don't know if you were able to jig it with that, but I got my problems with Calvin. But the whole thing is this, is that what I do have is, I want to share some things with you as, as an answer now. And Mr. Engineer, I want to go to Matthew's Gospel, chapter, chapter 13. Um... Mm. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13. A very interesting chapter, too, by the way, 13. Um, and in this chapter, this is the beginning of my understanding of the answers. First of all, it doesn't answer the question. Uh, the tribulation, the 1,000-year reign of peace. And one, I mean, if, you, if you're prayerful or, you, you know, you might ask the question, all right, after the tribulation, why do we have to stay on the earth for a thousand years. Why does God let Satan, why does God put a chain on Satan, put him in a prison for a thousand years, put him in a black hole, and then a thousand years later he's released? I mean, what's that? I mean, what is that? What, what, that's a part of the process, but why? You put him in prison and let him stay there. Give him a life sentence, but that is not the way things conclude. And we'll see how it concludes in Revelation chapter 20. Also, it, it does conclude in Revelation chapter 20, uh, verse, thir uh, uh, verse 13 and 14. Anyway, but here is who I have been called to serve. Now I have been called to preach the gospel to the poor. But let me tell you who I've been called to serve. It, it, here, and here's the reason why people choose wickedness rather than righteousness, by nine times and nine times. Um, verse 11, and this gets started with Jesus giving a parable about the, 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 the wheat and the tares, the sower and the seed. I don't have time to read all that. But the disciples, in verse 10, the disciples came and said to them, why speakest unto them in parables? And you might say they, you can use the term parables. Why well, speak it to them in a philosophical way? Because it's not a reality. It's a, it's a per, it is a projection of a thought idea, but it's something that never really took place. But it can be compared to human experience. Parables, philosophical, philosophy, right? And the disciples said, why are you talking like that to them? And here's what Jesus said in verse 11. And he answered and said to them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it's not given. That is right there. Close the Bible. Jesus said that it is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not. And you might have, you know, uh, any group of people anywhere, it could be two brothers. One has, one has been given the knowledge and the other has been kept out by God. God didn't give it to him. He didn't choose just to be evil. God didn't give him the knowledge. Two brothers. You know, you can only be a member of the family of God or the family of, of, of your family. You can't be a member of both because if God has chosen you to be a member 
of his family, of the kingdom, of the mysteries, of the knowledge. That means he pull you out from the blood consequences. So if you look at just this, and I haven't finished reading, I got more I'm going to read on this. If you look at this alone, what it says is that these people did no evil, they did no wrong, at least it appears that these people that Jesus was explaining the parable of the wheat and the tares to, they didn't do anything wrong. He just didn't give them the knowledge. You know, you say what you want about me, right? And you don't even have to believe this. Okay, let's go back to that from a moment ago. You don't have to believe it, but I'm telling you, God's, God's cho- I've been chosen by the Lord. I've, been, I've not only chosen Jesus, came firsthand and called me as a disciple like he did Augustine up out of the drunken stupor of the heroin smell of the Brooklyn House of Detention. He came and called me. I've been chosen. No, I ain't no doubt about that. You say what you want. Go where you want. You run around there with T.D. Jakes and Joel Osteen, all the hell you want. Or anybody else. They have not been chosen. They decided to go and try to fake it until they can make it. No. God chose me. And I've been telling that for 44 years, by the way. But watch this. Let's read a little bit further. Verse 12. For whosoever have to him shall be given. And he shall have more abundance. You know, you, I will never make bread. And I'm not saying that because I'm, I'm a some sort of stick-up king, a bank robber, a Wall Street person, or a politician, or a Baptist preacher. <laughs> but I will never make bread. I have what I what little I, I can have only two pennies right now. I guarantee you, homeboy. Two pennies in my hand as a righteous man is greater than two billion in the hand of Warren Buffett Bill Gates. I guarantee you. And not just that. Not just, I will never beg bread. Never, never beg bread. Never be defeated. A little let a righteous man have, uh, uh, Brother Donald Springfield, is greater than the riches of many wicked. I'll never beg bread. Verse 25 says, I've seen the, I have been young and now I'm old, yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor a seed begging bread. 12 watts. But watch this. Watch what it says here. Watch what it says here. It says, for whosoever have, to him shall be given, and he shall have even more. But to whosoever have not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Listen, they're talking about predestination, talking about Calvinists, talking about, you know, the people don't make the choice. That God chooses who will go and who will stay. And it just doesn't get in terms of, you know, being a part of the elect and getting a, getting a seat in a house in the 1,000-year reign of peace. It even goes to what you have. I ain't never, you know, I've even growing up down there, I don't know if my cousin Martin Patterson, Uncle Luke's oldest boy and only boy, uh, is listening to me, Martin Patterson, but I ain't never been without. Never. Now, there have been times there was, there was scarceness of food, and I'm just complaining about it. But no, I ain't never been without, and I never will. I never will. Because I, to me, God, God gave to me, and I can take one dollar would mean hang out with me, and I got one dollar, my friend, and you're hanging out with somebody who's better blessed than Warren Buffett. That's right. That's right. I got it going on. And, I, you know, I can say that. I'll say it because it's true. Anyway, that's what Jesus said. Verse 13. Now, I'm trying to get to why people choose wickedness and why they choose right. Well, maybe wickedness chose them and righteousness chose the other. Watch this. Verse 13. But, but, but I can tell you this, it isn't an easy position to be in because a lot of people hate you when they see you got that going on. When people see you're cloaked in righteousness and blessings and power of God, they hate the hell out you. They do. There he go again, you and that word hell in the, in the teeth. He, he, I, just, I just don't think he ought to use that word. I'm, okay, he explained this in the Bible, but 
I don't, I, I mean, it, it's just, I think he's been taking it out of context uh, and that uh, he using it to his own, I think he cursing, that's what I think. I am! <laughs> but I'm using a Bible word to do it! Anyway. Um, by cursing, I mean not using the four letter word, I mean I'm putting a spell on you. I'm cursing you with a spiritual anathema. Go look up anathema with your nappy head self. All right, therefore speak I unto them in parables because they seeing see not and hearing hear not, neither understand. Let me ask you a question. Anybody close to you, you try to tell them, come listen to Pastor Man, like Beulah Rogers, right? <laughs> Anybody close to you, right, the family member, maybe your husband, right? You tell them, come listen to Pastor Man. So finally they say, okay, I'll sit down and watch him on, on, on YouTube or Facebook or something, right? They sit there and they watch, and they sit and they watch, they listen. They get up, they go to the bathroom, they come back, they're looking at you. And they can't cuss. First of all, I preach for a long time. That's the first thing that ticks them off. When's it going to be over with? Baptists only preach 15 minutes. Pentecostals preach for 15 minutes, then talk in tongues for seven minutes, and then sing and dance for another five minutes. And that's it the, with them. But this Manning guy. So, so, but no matter what you show them, they just don't see me. They don't see it. They don't see what you, they don't see what you're so excited about. What is it about you? They don't see what you, what is he talking about anyway, right? They don't see it. And that's what Jesus said. They don't see it. They have eyes. Well, now I lost my chapter now. Therefore speak out to them in parables because seeing they see not, hearing they hear not, and neither do they understand. So we may be looking at something now as a potential answer. The fact it is so much that the people don't choose to do good. They just haven't been choose, chosen by God to be righteous. You know? Which makes me all the more excited to know who I am. I don't, you, can tell, you, can talk about, you can talk about Warren Buffett and Wall Street and Goldman Sachs and all them other people and the President of the United States. They can kiss my foot. I'm the Lord servant. No, whoo, Lord have mercy. I'm the Lord's servant. No, watch this. And Jesus said, now this is not my word. He said, now Jesus is telling them, he said, and in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. In other words, Jesus said, I ain't just saying this. Isaiah said this before, which said, by hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For these people's hearts is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing. Mr. Engineer, you remember I asked you earlier today, put up those pictures of those men standing outside the church. Put up that picture for just a second, right? Go up, pull it, pull, it, pull it up. Now, while he's looking for that, one of the reasons a lot of people did come to the church, you know, because there was a time there was a series of messages that I taught that were self, and that were, you know, just basic instructions on biblical instructions on how to build a better life. And then as a result of building a better life, you can you know, live a little bit more prosperous. Uh, you can become a much more refined person. Um, and it, it was such a part of the, the, the law teaching. I mean, there's all segments of the law. There is, you know, there's laws regarding, uh, you know, food. There's, a, there's laws regarding how you should dress. There's, you know, there's, there's ceremonial laws. There's rabbinical laws. There's, uh, they're kind of, kind, of, kind of laws. And I was in that structure at the time. So people came. And then when I started teaching righteousness, they all left. But Mr. Engineer, show me. These are some pictures. We have more than one of the one of these. Uh, that just uh, see these men stand. These are all men standing outside. That's right. That's right across the street from our church. That's the north side of 123rd Street, and the east side of Lenox Avenue. See these men. See how shabbily they're dressed. Nobody with a shirt. Nobody with a tie. You can walk down Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. But you can walk down Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard from the cross street of Malcolm X all the way over to Frederick Douglass Boulevard, crossing over Adam Clayton Powell and walking on Martin Luther King and scantly see a Hamite brother with a suit tie, with a, with a suit and a towel. You just ain't gonna see it. I mean, after, after all this civil rights, all the so-called black president, the so-called black mayors and congressmen and senators and all of that, 
the poverty is, is, it is off the charts and it's seen in their dress code. But these men see me every day. Now, if somebody come up and do something to me, you know, they'll fight, they'll cut, they'll, they'll, they'll cut a Japheth person's throat. And they'll cut a LGBT person throat if somebody touch me. But on the other hand, and they do that because they know I'm a stand-up man. They, they do it because I talk loud and say a lot. But they won't come in this church. They see me, but they really don't see me. Because they did, because I'd invite them in. They, they're dressed cold. I don't care how you dress. They see me, but they don't see me. They hear me. They're listening to me right now. I got to speak outside the church right this moment on, on the south side of 123rd Street and Lenox, and Lenox Avenue. I got to speak right now. Where they're right now, they are in earshot to hear every word I'm saying, but they won't come in there because they hear, but they hear not. That God hasn't chosen them. You know. Let me tell you something. If your wife don't want to come, it's because God hasn't chosen her. You say, what am I going to do? I'm going to divorce her. I don't know what the hell you're going to do. Your children don't come because God has not chosen your grandchildren, your mama, your father. None of them will come because God has not chosen them. Now, you can choose to be with them, but you're choosing against God. And that's just all that. I'm finished reading this. Wait a minute. Why am I closing the Bible so quickly on this one? I see my time is winding up. That's why I only got a few minutes left. I got to come back to this Matthew 13 business. Watch what the Lord said. For these people's heart is wax gross, their ears are dull of hearing, and their eye, these people are men on the street out there in front of the church, lest in any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted, and I should heal them. So, you know, there is this choice here, however. But, but Jesus is going on to say, blessed are you people from Adla, for your eyes they see and your ears for you hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which you see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear and have not, have not heard them. You sit up in the outlaw women's church, church, and you hear me preaching, right? And you say, doggone. I mean, many people in our church have relatives that are pastors, but they never heard what they're hearing here. And so it is a blessing to be here. All right, listen, I, I got a whole lot more on this because, it, you know, now that I'm all prayed up, it, I want to deal with this issue about why it's taking so long and why we're in the tribulation, why the coronavirus is, by the way, you know, and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and I, I, I'm going to attribute coronavirus to, to the pestilence as a segment of the prophecy of Jesus because Jesus is killing people. And I raised the question, why kill people? Why not just make them obey? I didn't answer that question, but remind me to come back to it. Wouldn't it be easier to just make people obey than to kill them? I'll give you a partial answer now. There are some people you can't make obey. Only, only death. That's the only thing that's good for them. You know? And some people are so far off the charts of what they've done against God and against God's people is that God's chosen not to save them. I want to throw them in hell for what they've done. And a lot of people have done something. I'll throw this in for, my, my, for me. You know, touch not mine anointed, neither do my prophet any harm. I'm going to tell you that now. I'm going to tell you now. Touch not my anointed and don't do my prophet any harm. And every word you speak against him, I don't care what you say, whether it's the truth or not, in judgment will be proven to be a lie. Don't be messing with my people, God said. All right, so now here, don't forget your tithing and your offerings. Use Cash App. Thank all of y'all for giving. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Brother Joseph Manning sent me something the other day. I don't know if I can sell that thing. I'm going to try to get somebody to make it, and we're going to get rich. <laughs> Short term, real quick, Miss Engineer. Give him a, give him a quick flash. Boop, now move it. Take it back. 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 <laughs> Uh, I was talking to my insurance broker the other day. She said to me, she's going to send me a cap, a baseball cap with a mask as well. So everybody trying to get into business. Yeah, so thank you for your giving. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your contributions. Peace out. This is a bit of a news blog we do looking at spiritual wickedness in high places for the most part, making uh, some observations about it and giving people a biblical foundation to the way of interpreting 
rather than have uh, uh, Sean Hannity or Laura Ingram or Janine Pirro or Anderson Cooper or Rachel Maydow or Don Lemon, uh, Rush Limbaugh interpret what's going on in the world. You come to me and I'll tell you based on what the word of God says. They'll just give you their worldly sinful view. But the man of will tell you what God has said, whether to say yea or nay, whether to go or to stay. You'll be like led by the word of Almighty God. Come to the Manning Report on a daily basis to interpret the spiritual wickedness in high places because there's plenty of it that's going on. And so I am he, I'm the Lord, sir, James David Righteous Rebel Manning. And I'm here to serve you with news and information.